earth-shattering this. The program devoted to those of you who have come to realize that the world's religious, political, economic, and military institutions are corrupt. That they always have been, and that they always will be. That they are not reliable. In fact, they are counterproductive. I am Yada. Our number, if you'd like to engage with us anytime over the next two hours, 877-300-7645. There's a story out of Nepal that is gut-wrenching, but it draws our attention to the problems associated with religion. A Nepalese man has confessed to the murder, but he did not act alone, of a young boy, a 10-year-old, after saying that a holy man advised him that human sacrifice would heal his ailing son. So this man's son was uh, was uh, sick. So the holy man said, well, why don't you go kill another uh, boy, sacrifice that boy's life to uh, to the God that we have imagined. And that will make the God that we have imagined really happy that you've gone off and slit a boy's throat in a ritual to him, sacrificing that child to him, and that will cause him to heal your child. <laughs> You know, I don't know what's worse. This religious buffoon concocting that story, or the man believing the story, or the man acting upon it and doing so with a number of others. And keep in mind that while this is um, one story out of a large world, human sacrifice has been part and continues to be part of religion. I was horrified one day. I was vacationing with my family in Hawaii, and uh, we were on the Kona coast of Hawaii. We went to the the far end of the uh, the island, and there we were confronted by uh, by something that. Well, I mean, I've seen temples where humans had their hearts cut out and held up to imaginary gods conceived by men and uh, lurid political and religious ceremonies, and they're equal, political, religious, and military. And these, the Incas, the Aztecs, and so many European and Asian and African religious and tribal rites, it's included uh, human sacrifice. It's a way for the king and the religious buffoons that the king empowers, or that, the other way around, the buffoons that the religious men empower as kings, work to suppress dissent. If you speak out against them, then you're the one that's sacrificed. If you don't obey their laws, you're the one they sacrifice. It keeps people in line, creates an orderly society. Well, even in Islam today, you know, you step an inch from whatever the Islamic interpretation, whether it's Sunni or Shia, is in your area. And if you're a Sunni and the Shias are empowered, they'll sacrifice your life to their God. If it's the other way around, they'll do the same thing to the same God. Think of the number of people that America has killed, all in the name of God bless America. So, here we are, a Nepalese uh, man went and, um, and killed this boy, the body of a 10-year-old. His name is uh, uh, Jibian Kohar was found uh, on the outskirts of the village in uh, southwestern Nepal. The child had gone missing three days earlier. The police, uh, who headed up an investigation, told CNN that Kodai Harijan admitted to committing the gruesome crime with his relatives after consulting the priest. In some cultures, priests are believed to have magical or spiritual powers to cure the sick. You know, that's true in Roman Catholicism. I mean, what's the, that whole uh, um, bit about performing rites and, uh, and, the, uh, and the miracles that are attributed to uh, Roman Catholics? You know, that's how you become a saint. You have to have a miracle attributed to you, no matter how concocted the story might have to be. And I also understand that 
that signs and wonders, these, uh, these kinds of pretenses, are uh, the very things that Yahweh says distinguish false prophets. That's why when Paul claims that he performs signs and wonders, and that's why when Christians says, oh, you're going to let us into heaven, Lord, Lord, because we perform signs and wonders, he says, get away from me. I don't know you. Those who show off in this regard are of no interest to Yahweh. And really, Yahweh only heals and does so on a very limited basis for the express purpose of saying, you know, you know, here I am, I, I healed this body. I only did so so that you might understand that that which was easy and fairly meaningless, really, demonstrates that maybe I have the authority and power to do what is difficult and meaningful, which is healing your flawed soul. And so God didn't do it because he wanted to show off. He only did it for a very limited period of time for the express purpose of saying, here's tangible evidence of something far more important. So according to the testimony given the police, the uh, Herogen and his relatives found the child playing with his friends in the village, and they lured him away by giving him a pack of biscuits and promising him 50 rupees, which is worth 49 cents. The boy was taken to a temple on the outskirts of the village where they performed a religious ritual. He was then taken to a field nearby where three people held him down as another slit his throat. The police found him the boy's head was severed from his body. Eleven people in total participated including the holy man, the priest. And they have all been arrested for their involvement, along with the, the perpetrators are facing uh, life sentences. At least five have confessed to their part in the murder. The villages in this district bordering India are home to some of the poorest and uh, least educated people. They're known as untouchables in the uh, traditional caste system. This is, of course, the problem of Hinduism is a caste system. Caste systems are, are a mix of politics and religion, too. They're a, a means, and economics, really. There was a caste system of the Roman Catholic Church for a thousand years between lords and serf. There was a, uh, a caste system in imperial Rome. You could be a slave with no rights. You could be a slave with some rights. You could be a patrician. You could be a plebeian. You could be any equestrian. And, of course, you could uh, be a, uh, an elitist, a senator of, or, uh, or of that rank. And a person's economic rights, the person's freedoms, all depended on the rank into which they were born. It was a political system and a religious system that established these things. That's one of the reasons why political and religious systems are so revolting. These systems still exist throughout India. And in India, with Hinduism, villages routinely do heinous things to uh, little boys and little girls. You know, there's a little girl that might say, I, there's been a dozen stories we've reported on out of India like this where a little girl will say, you know, at 12 years old, she doesn't want to have to marry some ugly dude. She doesn't want to continue to be subjected to the harassment and the degrading nature of living in a particular village. She just wants to leave. You know, you can have your disgusting religion. You can have your disgusting social ways. I just want out of here. And for, for trying to leave them, they will strip her naked. They will beat her publicly. They will rape her publicly, gang rape her. And then kill her. It happens all the time in India under the guise of Hinduism. And I'm not certain that this individual was Hindu or Buddhist or some other moronic religion, but it doesn't matter. This is what religious people have done for centuries. Superstitions such as sacrificial slaughter of animals and uh, water buffaloes, goats and chickens are commons among the country's uh, mainly Hindu population. 
the ritual killing of animals uh, during the, the uh, during the Vatimai festival, uh, celebrated every five years, takes place, and, and under the belief that by killing they will have prosperity. It's the same thing with Islam. You know, the more infidels you kill as a jihadist, the more prosperous your stay in the Islamic paradise will be. The more Islam grows, the more Islam thrives, the more people are sacrificed to its God. It's very unfortunate, it says in this article, so what happened from the government's level, we're going to launch an awareness program against these superstitions. <laughs> you need to launch an awareness program to the superstition that there is a, a God out there that if you're willing to take the innocent life of a child and slit their wrist, bribing them off from playing with his or her friends, that this God will somehow intervene to heal your son. Wow. Aren't people easily fooled? There's a story out of Washington that is indeed troubling. Heroin use in the United States is up. Now you think, all right, heroin is up uh, because of America's invasion of Afghanistan. That was one of the counterproductive, there's a score of counterproductive consequences of our invasion of Afghanistan, but one of them was that uh, the uh, heroin population, uh, the heroin production has soared uh, there in Afghanistan. It was essentially obliterated under the Taliban regime and has flourished now that Americans are there. And um, I think Afghanistan produces something like uh, 80 plus percent of the heroin for the world markets. That's nice for America to have invaded the country and have reestablished heroin. And in addition to Europe, a large part of it is coming to the United States. So heroin is more prevalent. It's one of the reasons why I say that, that America's war on drugs is insane. Um, anything that you have done for a long period of time that has produced the opposite results that you have desired, drugs are more available, they're used in greater quantity, the purity of those drugs is superior, and so anything that you have done where you have invested billions upon billions of dollars and you've got the opposite result that you have sought, you ought not continue. We'll be back. Heroin consumption is up a little bit. You know, if we were sending hundreds of thousands of Americans to prisons to prison. In fact, probably over a million Americans are in prison for uh, drug use. Uh, and if it were weren't for the fact that we're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to incarcerate and make uh, completely uh, um, Dependent on the uh, the government, uh, these uh, million men and women, this might not be such a big deal. If we weren't deploying massive amounts of of police, massive amounts of judicial resources, trillions of dollars really, uh, in this uh, failed war on uh, on drugs, then maybe it, the fact that the heroin was up ever so slightly, wouldn't be all that big a deal, but it's not up a little bit, it's up a lot. 232% between uh, 2008 and 2012. Between 2008 and 2012, heroin use in the United States increased 232%. When is it, how much failure does one have to see? before they pull the plug on failed programs, particularly ones that cost trillions of dollars and that have failed ever since their invention. The war on drugs is one of those. Well, you'd have to be a moron to take uh, heroin. And uh, I'm just telling you this, that you know, if you've got financial problems, we'll go ahead and take heroin and see if you can uh, inject and, and snort and smoke your way to prosperity. Or if, in fact, you become more in debt and now in debt to people that uh, don't simply uh, accept bankruptcy as a final solution. If you think that your love life is on the rocks, well, go ahead and start uh, a heroin addiction because it'll turn your skin a ghoulish gray, your lips will shrivel up, 
your eyes will sink into your head. You'll look like a zombie. That ought to help you in your love life. You know, if you're uh, despondent because other people are outthinking you, they're outmaneuvering you, they're outpositioning you, well, you just go ahead and become a heroin addict, and, uh, and you see how much more competitive you are against your peers. Now, drugs are stupid. But if you want to kill yourself, if you want to destroy yourself, you, know, you ought to be allowed to. You know, it's, uh, it's not society's job to, uh, to set rules on self-destructive behavior. Somebody wants to do something that's self-destructive, let them do it. Let's not have a criminal enterprise that's turned much of South America and almost all of Central America into a giant crime syndicate where no one is safe in those countries. And all of it exists, all of that hellish condition throughout Central America and Northern South America exists because of America's appetite for drugs and the fact that we have made them illegal. If we simply made them legal, the usage would not go up, the prison population would go down, the cost of policing and the Justice Department would shrink by 70%. And what little business there would be in these mind-altering drugs would be taxable and wouldn't be uh, provided at gunpoint. There are 600,000 heroin users in the United States. And think of that, 600,000. Then you'd add to that crystal meth users, cocaine users, you know, the crack form as well. You know, it, methamphetamines, it goes on and on. Drug abuse in the United States, and then you've got those that are addicted to psychiatric drugs, to painkillers, and to mood elevators. And I'll bet you that the total number um, is in the tens of millions. Tens of millions. A Florida police officer is now under investigation, according to a... Uh, a videotape that was obtained that shows the footage of the cop tossing peanuts into the mouth of a homeless man and then um, barking at dog commands at him. Sit, stay. The man was in jail because he was homeless, because you know, evidently he wouldn't abide by the rules as to where he tried to sleep on some sidewalk. And just like the woman that failed to indicate that she was changing lanes, was thrown in jail and ended up dead. This cop thought it would be fun because he had power over this man. Throw peanuts at him like he was a dog. Welcome back to Shattering Mist. A couple of days ago, out of uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, uh, Barack Hussein Obama decided that he would wade into the current uh, election and that he would assail Republican candidates. Now, his, uh, his comments were that the, the commentary, the evaluation by Republicans like Huckabee and, um, and the Donald in particular were under his... Uh, view outrageous and sad. And then he said, you know, at this time, America needs a different quality of leader. Of course, he's speaking of himself. Outrageous and sad. Now, here's a man that would not tell even the Congress or the Senate that has to confirm uh, any treaty and has always in the past been uh, contributors and participants in negotiation of treaties because that is their role in the Constitution. They would not give any information whatsoever about the terms and conditions that they were negotiating. And said no one can speculate on it, no one can talk about it. And then when it was uh, 
completed his comments where you can't criticize this unless you've read the whole thing and talked about the, the whole thing. Well, I read the agreement. And I'm here to tell you it was nothing but capitulation. And you know you have done something, you should know anyway, that you've done something wrong when the week after you have this agreement, first of all, the people you're negotiating with celebrate as they have won a great victory, and, and they did. They, they crossed the board, prevailed. But within a week of that time, the supreme leader of Iran, the Grand Ayatollah Sustaini, uh, not Sustaini, but uh, Khomeini, he, uh, the Sustaini, is the, uh, is the leader of Iraq, which is today Iran West. He was giving a speech condemning America. And the shouts in unison, all choreographed as part of the political and religious head of Iran's government, were death to America, death to Israel. Death to America, death to Israel. In other words, we, we engaged in this whole nuclear episode so that we could deliver, let's see, what did they say? Death to America, death to Israel. And so you did something, Mr. Obaminator, that caused the, those you were negotiating with to shout out with great pride that you enabled them to deploy death in America and be the merchant of death, the bringer of death in Israel. And yet, when someone criticizes your negotiation of capitulation, they're outrageous and sad. America needs a different type of leader. What? A leader that just capitulates to one's foes? A leader that enables the nuclear program of a nation that wants to destroy it? Um, you know, it's almost a loss for words as to how repulsive the President of the United States is and how dim-witted Americans had to be to elect him once, much less twice. And the fact that no one gets it. Now, here's a, an agreement that the Saudis hate and the Israelis hate. The Kuwaitis hate. The Turks hate. And that right-thinking Americans should hate. In fact, fact, the majority of Americans oppose the treaty. Total capitulation. Hundreds of billions of dollars to Iran to continue to finance its nuclear program. And all this man got was a one-year delay for the release of hundreds of billions of dollars. But Oh, but it was his view that if Iran recovers and becomes economically stable, that, oh, that it will be a much less menacing place. Huh. And they're going to stop being Muslims? That's going to these releasing their ability to buy all the weapons they could possibly deploy and releasing the ability to engage in the sale of oil so they can afford a mountain of weapons so that they can continue to slaughter Sunnis in Iraq and in Syria. That um, that's going to create a more stable world. Hey, you can't say this is naive. No one can be that naive. He didn't do it out of naivete. He knew what he was doing. And what's the worst thing about all of this is that to serve up total capitulation, even to get the Iranians to transfer some of their highly enriched uranium into uh, other forms, which would take them a year to 
we convert into weapons-grade uranium. The back room negotiations, the promises from this administration to undermine Israel were overwhelming, and they're very real. You need to know that to get the slightest concession from Iran, the Secretary of State and the President promised to deliver what they want most of all, the slicing up of Israel. Yahweh heard what they had to say, which is why he revealed it to us in the 17th and 18th chapters of Isaiah, Yahshua. At the moment the treaty is ratified in the Senate, that the abomination administration will resume its pressure on Israel on an international basis to compel Israel to sacrifice the West Bank and much of its center core to the very foes who will seek to destroy them, who are terrorizing them, who have been at war with them and have murdered them for a matter of some 1,400 years. That's what the promise was. And you will see it play out. That is what this administration promised to do. It's why you ought not be engaged in this government. It's why you ought not be patriotic. You don't want to associate with that kind of thing. Speaking of associating with the wrong kind of thing, Turkish President Tarek Erdogan said on Tuesday that it was impossible for him to continue a peace process with Kurdish militants and urged the Parliament to strip politicians with links to the Kurds. So no, we're not going to integrate the Kurds, which is the largest ethnic minority in the world without their own country. It's so hypocritical for uh, Muslims to, uh, to speak of exiled Palestinians and oppressed Palestinians and, and of Palestinians being booted out of their land and living as refugees when there is no ethnic group called a Palestinian. But there really is an ethnic group called Kurds. There's 30 to 40 million of them, and they're abused in every Islamic country. They do not have a homeland. And here is Erdogan saying, if you, if you wish to, um, to engage with them, then uh, I, won't, I won't keep you out of jail. You'll find yourself in jail. And oh, by the way, these Kurds that have thus far been the only effective means of thwarting the advance of the Islamic State, well, now those Kurds are the enemy of Turkey because Turkey is bombing them. When they began their bombing runs on Syria, well, they had as many bombing runs on the Kurds. So talk about being counterproductive. On one hand, you arm the Kurds to oppose the Islamic State, and on the other hand, you now bomb those very same Kurds while you're bombing the Islamic State. Scott has indicated I don't have my switchboard up, that so we have a caller that's Rob from Michigan. Hello, Rob. And have you to say this fine day? I'm doing fine. Good, good. I just wanted to thank you for your program, and you and Kirk have been knocking it dead with the exposing power. It's just been really exciting for me, and I know it has been for you. And I just wanted to, I, you mentioned the illegal drugs mm -hmm. um, a little while ago, and you're discussing it. Yeah. Um, I'd like to shatter a myth okay. on your show. I'd like to shatter uh, the myth of cannabis. Okay. And I'd like your opinion on that. Okay. And I'd like to present my facts. Okay, go ahead. Um, first, I want to point to the United States patent number 6630507. And that's held by the uh, U.S. Department of Health uh, since okay. October 2003. Okay. And uh, this patent is 
on the cannabinoids within the cannabis itself. Okay. And um, if you go through and, you know, read their patent, mm -hmm. you'll see that, you know, these cannabinoids not only work, but they, I mean, actually, actually cure people with different diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. I mean, they help them, you know, help them along with their um, struggles, but they also eliminate the diseases, um, the various cancers and different things. You really have to go through the patent yourself, but... Okay. The whole myth about the cannabis thing, we weren't taught anything about cannabis in our general studies throughout school. It was kind of wiped out of our history, more or less. Um, the Constitution was written on cannabis. Uh, we built, you know, ropes and during the wars out of cannabis. Uh, houses in France are completely built out of cannabis. Um, all these different things that were hidden from us. Uh, I just like to expose it. All right. So you're a uh, you're an advocate of uh, cannabis, uh, and uh, my view is that it most certainly ought not be illegal. In fact, you ought not have anything illegal. That a large uh, percentage of your population engage in, you ought not call a large percentage of your population criminal. Well, I understand that there are a lot of people that. Um, that view uh, cannabis as a uh, net contributor to uh, society. And I, I'm not among them. I don't use uh, cannabis. But uh, you know that I am wholly and completely uh, pro-choice. So I think people ought to have the right to use it, and I would legalize it in, uh, in every state, but still have very strict prosecution that if you uh, show up to work under the influence, you're driving a car under the influence, that uh, the first time the penalty is severe, the second time you uh, you lose your job, you uh, you lose your right to uh, to drive, because then you're putting other people at risk. I would also warn you and say that while I am certain that there are s some benefits of cannabis, yes, you talked about rope making, and well, although most things are synthetics now, and that uh, that um, uh, was that construction project, uh, I mean, material, although that's it's not ideal for that. Uh, you know, by comparison to others, construction materials. Better. Yeah. Uh, in the country. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, uh, I would... In the 1300s, we're still using them. Uh, yeah, well... Evidence and reason. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to buy that, uh, that cannabis out. is a... Is a that that uh, if I build my house uh, out of uh, a framing and put a brick exterior uh, on it and you build yours out of cannabis, that yours is going to be uh, more uh, 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 habitable and less, uh, less likely to, uh, to fail than, uh, than mine. But, you know, it, but you're, you're welcome to, uh, to, to build a house out of cannabis. I, I would, I, Using evidence and reason would say yeah. that we don't know how long the brick and the, and the, the, the stuff that we use now could possibly last. It's obviously better because it, it lasts through much longer things. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I've uh, had a lot of brick houses and um, not had any uh, any issues. But anyway, you know, I, you know, uh, if you if if you want, you know, if you want to uh, to build a a, a cannabis house or want a cannabis, house, that is fine with me. Um, I would be the thing I would caution on is is curing cancers. Um, yeah. The uh, I, there are there are almost everything uh, in nature when synthesized, will have a positive and a negative effect uh, in, uh, in extreme uh, doses. And, and I'm certain that there are positive effects of, uh, of the narcotic in, uh, in cannabis. Um, it's supposed to be very good for people that have the nauseous effect of when they're taking chemotherapy. And so there's, a, there's an association there. But uh, I, the cancer is... Uh, is a ordinary cell that just multiplies too quickly, and it does so in a hypoxic environment. And the only thing that kill it are poisons. So if you're going to suggest that a po that that um, cannabis is effective uh, against cancer, then you'd have to relegate cannabis to the category of poisons. Uh, the the kind of poisons that kill cancer are those that can be, uh, that either work because, well, they'll kill any cell. The cancer cell is, uh, is a bit weaker 
because uh, of it exists in a hypoxic environment. Um, or things that are, and that's what my son does now for a living, he's, he's researching uh, natural products. Uh, there's a birch bark right now that is uh, very effective at working in the hypoxic environment of, uh, of a tumor and can target the inside of the tumor, but it still has to deliver the poison. And so, uh, you know, those things that kill cancer are, are a poison. In fact, the first chemotherapy kinds of drugs, the first anti-cancer drugs, were a derivative of, of, um, of uh, the nerve gases used in World War I. So it's just in the case of cannabis, it doesn't kill the cancer. It strengthens your endocannabinoid system, which in return kills the cancer because each one of us has cancer on an average of six times in our lifetime, but our body automatically kills it because that's the way it's designed. But when we're weakened in our endocannabinoid system, they can't kill it. So it just grows. So it doesn't really kill the cancer. It strengthens the cells that exist to kill the cancer. I mean, the Department or the University of Israel uh -huh. has done the most study on it out of any other, you know, organization in the world. And uh, you can do the research. Okay. Okay. The, in 1964, there, are, there are lots of things uh, that uh, strengthen our immune system. Um, and... Uh, if cannabis is one of the things that, uh, that strengthens our immune system, then by golly, uh, you know, if I had cancer and I had proof, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not an expert on it. I'm, I'm just, uh, I really don't have any interest in, in using cannabis. But if there was proof uh, that uh, it would help my immune system fight off cancer, man, I'd, uh, I'd be uh, smoking like a pipe.